around the UK are estuaries and creeks which are littered with the ghosts of our maritime past. There are hulks and wrecks lying in the reeds, semi-submerged in the mud, often in touching distance from the shore. Now, for a country such as ours, with such a significant maritime heritage, some of those wrecks have fascinating histories of their own. You just need to know where to look. I've come down to Old Mill Creek near Dartmouth, one of our oldest, most important ports is just round the corner there, to see if I can find out more. Ron, that was probably one of my favourite walks I've had for months. And we've come to this mysterious wreck. Well, what is this thing? Okay, so these are the believed remains of the Mayfly, which is a 19th century paddle steamer. So it's quite a large thing. And what it was is a hulk. So a hulk is where you strip out the engines and it becomes just essentially, it just becomes the vessel and it's used for an isolation hospital ship is the belief. So in uh, Dartmouth, after they build the hospital, there is no facilities for quarantining people, so isolation, something we know a lot about at the moment. Um, so essentially, a local landowner doesn't allow them to build an isolation hospital, so that's a hospital where you quarantine people with diseases such as yellow fever, cholera, various things that are coming in off ships. So they decide to use boats. So this is the likely remains of the Mayfly, which is a paddle steamer they bought from Liverpool to do this job. It ends up here due to its replacement, the Kingswear Castle, which and the second one I'm sure a lot of people will have traveled on is that big one with the paddles. Um, it is replaced. This one is the early one that they use up until, I think for it's bought in 1890s and then it's used all the way up until 1922. So it has a capacity of around 30 and essentially it's a yellow fever ship. So when there would be p contagious people on board, you would have a yellow flag up and it ends up here because essentially it's the last of its life. So a lot of hulks are used all the way up until they deteriorate and in this case it is the exact same and it was meant to be broken up here but sadly for, uh, sorry not sadly greatly for us <laughs> in great news it's still here by the looks of it what are we actually looking at there what are those remains of that boat so we don't have a full site pl uh, plan of the site yet we were meant to do that in 2020 but obviously with the covid restrictions we haven't got down to survey but what we're looking at by the looks of it is one half of the vessel and you can see just there is where the paddles would have come out and the paddle boxes would have been we haven't really got round to the other side because of the deep mud yet. The plan was to come out here with uh, Southampton students, students from the University of Southampton, and record this using an RTK, which is essentially a very fancy GPS. And what we're looking at, so you can see the stuff buried underneath, you'll have the main part of the hull and the keel. Um, I believe this is the bow at this end, but again, we need to do a bit more survey and have a little clear away some of that seaweed and have a look at what we're talking about. So these are potentially what is left of the boxes for the paddles. So the Mayfly was sold after it uh, no longer was an isolation ship or fever hulk as it's commonly referred to in the documents. Um, it was sold to Ditsons and Dormans who were famous boat breakers on the Dart at the time. Um, and they started breaking the vessels in Old Mill Creek. They still, the family is still based here and they still own a boatyard all the way up at the top of the creek. Um, it is referred to in Lost Ships of the West Country as these, when he surveyed, or he didn't survey, he had a look at the vessels back in the 80s, I think it's early 80s that book was written, uh, he mentions that there's paddles left on the side, and this is potentially those, but again, what we need to do is to have a look at them, photograph them, start, start measuring them up and see if we can't align it to common things we see in paddle steamers for the time. Do we have any idea what it would have been like on that when it was a fever boat? Okay, so this is actually a good story. So in the local archives, um, which immediately I can't get to at the moment, the reports of it in the, its last days of being a fever ship, that is about it's unfit for human habitation. By the 1920s, it is declared unfit. No one is at this flooding of the rooms, and they're still using it, incredibly, <laughs> but suddenly the medical officers say, we're not, we're not using the Mayfly anymore. It needs to be broken up. It needs to be dumped, and it ends up here. That is the main parts of those records, is those arguments between uh, the medical office and the harbour boards about what they're going to do about this isolation hospital ship. They do try and give it a last uh, bit of life. So what you ha have with a lot of hulked vessels and abandoned vessels is they pour concrete in between the seams uh, of the framing, which gives it a little bit longer lifespan. Um, as I said, this is now replaced by a lot later. There is a huge argument back and forth that's in the archives. Um, about getting a replacement for this ship. 
which is eventually the Kingswear Castle, which is a famous, another famous vessel, the original Kingswear Castle, which is dumped up on the weir at Totnes. Not on the weir, further down from the weir. Um, and that is its replacement. But yeah, we don't know that much about, we know that it could accommodate up to around 25 patients, but in those late days, there wasn't that many records, but I imagine with flooded rooms and unfit for human habitation, it is not a place you would want to spend the night. <laughs> So this is just one wreck of many all the way around here, isn't it? What, what do we know about the others? Okay, so the area itself is known as Rough Hole Point. Uh, and these are Rough Hole Mudflats. So we have uh, the Mayfly. Basically, the area has been used for dumping boats for countless uh, years. And it's often here, down here is where Ditsons used to break boats quite commonly. So around the corner, we have a boat breaking yard, or what we believe to be a boat breaking yard. Over in the distance, over there, is the Invermore, which was a one of the last built schooners uh, in the UK and that was has another fascinating history but doesn't pay its harbour dues so the D Dartmouth tows it out here and dumps it so it's a common place for dumping of vessels you find these across the whole of the UK there will be areas where you find concentrations of ships and vessels which were commonly areas where they dumped them for unpaid dues to the most common reason for why vessels get like this is they were either set there to be broken up and the, br uh, the breaking of them became untenable or unfeasible or they were meant to be converted into houseboats something went wrong and then they just end up de deteriorating on our foreshores they do make nice things but they are lovely now so what's your job in relation to wrecks like this what can we do to uh, keep an eye on them i suppose there's nothing we can do to make sure they don't deteriorate until they vanish is there so you are fighting the inevitable you can't fight tides um and that's part of the reason why citizen was set up so citizen stands for coastal intertidal zone archaeological network and it's all about preservation by record you can't fight climate change as we know you can try when it comes to the foreshore it's a hugely dynamic environment it's constantly changing and it's something that's been overlooked in archaeology for years um so these vessels will slow deteriorate and we do not plan to preserve them lift them or any of that that stuff unless they've proved to be incredibly important. Um, the plan is to monitor their deterioration. We need to get the record now so that we can get that information out there so that people know the story. Because I find, especially with the 2020, this vessel suddenly became very interesting due to its, hospital, um, due to its past in a hospital isolation ship. So we wrote a blog about it on the website and now I am researching into doing further stuff on this one and the uh, Kingswear Castle. But um, the main thing we need to get done is a record of how many there is. Where, what are they? How many there is? A lot of these vessels were looked at kind of by passing, passing tourists. There is um, records of people on the passenger ferry talking about when these had masts on and when they were fully upright. Uh, but of course, one of the biggest problems is they refer to them by name. And as soon as your vessel starts to deteriorate, they all start to look the same. So when you've just got a keel and framing, it then becomes a very a harder job to investigate the different little um, things that tell you what that vessel is. Then you have to compare those to the original plans if you have them or compare them to iconography of the time. So you work for Citizen, the Coastal and Intertidal Zone Archaeology Network, is that right? Yeah, sure. And so what can people do to get involved? Because it was set up to, to allow people to get involved in this kind of heritage, wasn't it? Okay, so Citizen is Coastal Intertidal Zone Archaeological Network. So as we know, archaeologists love acronyms. Ours was a particularly long one, but it's set up as a community project. So the, essentially what we came to realise and what most of archaeologists are now realising, there will never be enough marine archaeologists. There will never be enough archaeologists to cover the foreshores, especially in the UK where you have a tidal reach it's most of around eight metres. You're talking hundreds of thousands of metres of foreshore to look at and things constantly eroding out and, and becoming revealed or sadly deteriorating and being lost. Um, so what we do is we set up, we work with local communities. So I work down here in Devon and we work with local communities to survey this archaeology before it's gone. Um, so what we do is we go out onto the foreshores, we pick sites using the HR or we go out and we just monitor sites like um, Mersey Island and down here where you have lots of archaeology becoming eroded out on a regular basis and we just need to get a record of that because some of it is incredibly important and without the public, which is what we need to monitor this stuff, um, we just don't know. There's, it's a mystery how much archaeology has already been lost and now we need the communities to get on board and start telling us about this stuff. We're not, there's never going to be enough archaeologists to know. We need to be able to respond 
to something. So we need to be able to respond to our communities using the app, uh, which it allows them to record archaeology as it becomes eroded out of the foreshores. Just tell us quickly how people could get involved. Okay, so if you want to get involved, um, you can just email us, you can get involved with webinars, you can just volunteer in your local discovery programme. Um, we are talking about running online courses and various other stuff in the future. Um, but the easiest way is get the app. Uh, so the app's on the Play Store, it's on the uh, Apple Store. And what you need to do with the app is walk your, fo walk your dog, do whatever you do on the foreshores usually, and we just need photos of stuff. So if you see something that looks unusual, you don't really know what it is, take a photo, uh, write a little description, and just get it to us. You do not have to know the terminology. You don't have to know the bits of boats. You just need, we just need photos. We need to be able to know that stuff is there. That's the main problem we have at the moment. We need to know it exists before we can actually react and study it. Just don't go onto the other side because then there'll be a big scour. I'm quite worried I'm going to fall over in this and just completely face plant. So yeah, that's the sponsor in there, I think. So see how it comes out? What are we looking at here? So what we're looking at here is we have, this is my version of a boat drawn beautifully in the mud. Um, so on a paddle steamer you of course will have the two paddles on the outside which provide the propulsion and that's what we look like we have the remains here. So these are boxed in and uh, the paddles were likely removed when they hulked it um, but the boxes would have existed so this bit you can see jutting out of the wreck oddly is most likely these boxes here. So um, these the boxes which held the paddles, that's what would have been here. Yeah, that's what I believe these are. Um, so you see how it juts out from the side of the, side of the vessel here? Yeah. So, um, see, it comes out quite a long way. And then you've got another attachment further down, yeah, yeah. exactly the same, roughly the right distance apart. And then on the other side, although you can't see it from this angle, there is also the exact same thing. So this is likely the remains of where those paddles would have been. It doesn't take too much imagining to just conceive of these huge paddles churning up the water, going off down to Dartmouth, or even just, just sort of sitting here lying still with everyone on board suffering from yellow fever, or whatever it might have been. <laughs> here you can see the concrete. So what's the concrete for? The concrete is to give it a little bit of life. In, the old, in the, its last days of vessels, it's a way of giving them the last little bit of life. So you pour it in between the framing, it sinks the, sinks the hull down, but it also tighten, tightens up all those holes in the hull. So it just gives it a little bit more life. So it's a very common way to get a couple more years out of a vessel as a pontoon or something um, of its repurposing. Ah, does that look a last gasp effort? Yeah, to, it's to kind of like last Hail Mary pass. It's a Hail Mary. Chuck it, <laughs> yeah. chuck concrete in the framing and it'll last a couple more years. And then, yeah, after that, you then start the process of breaking it up. Which is not easy. If it, I mean, is this this is no, made I, of iron, yeah? Yeah, this is iron. Is um, it iron and concrete. And how do you how do you? How do you, how do you get rid of something made out of it iron is and a concrete? Question. Um, I, I believe they work from the top down, but I honestly don't know. So I've been talking to boat breakers, particularly one of the last um, Ditson boat breakers left, about how would you actually break down a vessel because it's kind of a mystery to me. I understand it on big vessels, but when it comes to small stuff like this, I'm not. 100% sure how what the process of breaking it down would be. It's amazing that there's so much more that there is to learn um, in, in all aspects of maritime archaeology but it's quite a curious one that you know you've got so much more to learn about how to <laughs> dismantle boats. Yeah it was, it's one of those things though, that's the common way to study the wooden ships if we take them apart. With the metal ships it becomes a bit harder because you have concretion so as you can see uh, iron reacts to salt water and you can see it, um, it blooms out and it becomes an amor amorphous mess, essentially. And that makes it a lot di more difficult to work out what little bits are. So probably what we'll do is use an RTK to take really detailed recordings of this. And we'll also use a technique called photogrammetry to take a, um, a 3D model of one side and then illustrate up where all those rivets are so that we can match it to common building techniques for the time. So one of these is Britain's last schooner. Yeah, is that so, right? so it's a bit of a, let's call it a bit of an exaggeration in the text so it's um it calls it the last british built schooner so it's built in arklo in ireland right so it's kind of i think uh it's interesting because essentially it ends up there because it doesn't pay its harbour dues so it's a vessel called the invermore which i believe is a schooner uh, so it's two masted um and it was meant to be used 
after it's, it was meant to be used for a trip to Australia, so it was meant to be a ferry ship to Australia. That falls through from Dartmouth to Australia and essentially it stops paying its harbour dues, uh, its mooring fees and the harbour master dumps it up here and then it became essentially a tourist attraction for people going past. There's a lot of speak of uh, talks of when it was um, in, its, in its shape. And then we have this weird period in the, I think it's the 80s, uh, in a few sources it talks about the National Maritime Museum came to finish the job on it and took out the engine and a few other bits and I'm yet to find where those bits ah. ended up. So lurking in the National Maritime Museum, it's maybe it's, the remains yeah, of remains Britain's these, last schooner. Likely with a little note on them just saying, we took this from the inland <laughs> Yeah, but, sorry. But no one knows. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then obviously with a lot of vessels, locals, yeah. If you leave something of value on a foreshore, it will be pilfered, and even more, like a lot of these vessels, stuff is stripped off them. Is um, part of the advantage of this being quite isolated that these have been pretty much left alone? Some of it is. Um, the Invermore definitely is, because you can see how far out it is. It's very hard to get to on foot. Um, you can get to it by, by boat, but um, yeah, the part of the reason that these are still here is, yeah, it's quite isolated. There's not that many people that come down here regularly. Um, but yeah, that's it pretty much. Yeah, it's kind of its isolation. Yeah, it's a wonderful place. Let's go and explore some more. Come on.